Hey, um, my name is Rachel and I am a PhD student here at BYU studying lichens. Uh, you may not have heard of lichens before and so that's what I'm here to do for you today is tell you a little bit about lichens so that you can start to notice them everywhere around you. Um, so they really are growing all over the place, all over the world. You'll find them on trees and rocks in the soil, but you can even find them growing on buildings. Um, and you may have seen them and thought they were moss or something like that because they grow in similar ecosystems, you know, in nooks and crannies and wet places, um, but they're actually completely unrelated to moss. And so let's go into a little bit about what lichens are. So they're not actually one living thing. They're actually an association between two things. Um, they're an association, association between fungi and algae. If you've never heard of algae before, it's related to that green slimy stuff that you find growing in a fish tank or a pond. Um, and so the, the algae actually photosynthesizes, which means that it gets its food from the sun, and then it shares that food with the fungi that houses it. So that's pretty cool, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to study lichens, is just because they have this really interesting um, association where you know, they can't really survive with each other, but then they come together and form this whole new thing that looks completely different than they would have looked like apart. Um, so I think that's really cool, and that's why I wanted to learn more about lichens. Um, and it doesn't just have to be one fungus and one algae that are coming together. We're finding out that it can be multiple fungi and multiple algae, even some bacteria, that are all coming together to form this ecosystem. So it's not just like, you know, some individual organism out there that's just by itself. There's really this union of things that come together to form this. Um, and for that reason, we've had a really hard time forming lichens in the lab. You know, this is a really complicated inter interaction. And so they're a really special, what we call a composite organism, which means that there are a bunch of organisms coming together to form this one unit. Um, and as I mentioned, they can be found all over the place in the most extreme ecosystems. They're even found in the driest desert in the world in Chile. Um, and they're also found in rainforests. And there's different species that really tend to thrive in different areas. So, um, but they're even found in Antarctica. So it's really cool to go out there and see how these, um, how they're able to thrive in these different areas. Um, and you can even find them here in Utah. So in your neighborhood, definitely check out the bark on the trees. You'll probably see some greenish or even orange lichens growing there. If you head over to the mountains, you'll find a lot of lichens growing on the rocks. They tend to really love the, the, the lichens here tend to really be able to thrive in the dry environment that we have. And they tend to grow, as you can see here, um, they tend to grow right up against the piece of rock like this. So everything growing on this rock right here is a different species of lichen. Um, and so there's many different forms. So you'll see that there are these that grow tightly up against the rock. Um, but we also have some species that tend to grow more branch-like. So this is growing on a piece of wood um, and you can see it's kind of like shrubby um, and I'll hold it up closer so you can see it. Um, and so this, this is a lichen um, and then I even have, so this too would grow um, on a piece of wood and this is um, called a lungwort because it looks kind of like a, some, a pair of lungs. Um, and so these are really cool. Um, and then I even have right here, like this is a lichen too. It looks like hair almost. So it's really cool to see the different, um, different appearances that it can take on depending on what's coming together to form this um, organism. And as I mentioned, they can even grow in some weird places like buildings. Um, so here I even have a piece of bone that has lichens growing on it. So, you know, it's just, a really cool organism that if you keep your eye open and you're like paying attention to these little things that are growing all over the place, you might tend to pick up on them and see them um, in different areas. So that's really fun to start hunting for them. Um, so you might be wondering, okay, so 
now I know about lichens, but how do they fit into the ecosystem? How do they fit into the world around me? And so lichens tend, they can make soil by breaking down rocks. Um, they can feed reindeer and insects. Um, in like Norway, they can feed reindeer when it's getting to be winter. Um, they can provide nesting material. I think I'm back. Okay. <laughs> um, and so uh, there's hummingbirds that make tiny little nests um, with pieces of lichen. And they can also house some small creatures like insects. Um, and so they can be really important for the ecosystem. And for us as humans, they've been used historically as dye. Um, so dyeing um, pieces of wool or fabric to create different colors of, of fabric. Um, and they can be really important, we're finding, for medicine. So um, there are scientists who are looking into the different components of lichens that can be used for medicine, which is really cool. Um, and they're also used to measure how clean the air is. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's called a bioindicator. So they're a bioindicator of the air quality. Um, so they're really cool and can be really important to the ecosystem, even though they're so small. So right now, I'm sitting in the lichen herbarium, um, and this is where we keep a bunch of different lichen specimens. A specimen is just one, well, I'll show you. <laughs> um, so a specimen, each of, so behind me, there's tons and tons of shelves, um, and in each of them, there's a drawer that you pull out, and then in each drawer, we have a little packet like this, and it has the name of the species, it has where it was collected, the year it was collected, um, everything that you would want to know about this and if you wanted to come back to it and know everything about it, about when it was collected um, and even like the year. So this one was collected in 1989 and I'll show you this one later. Um, it's part of my little uh, show and tell. But in each, so in each of these envelopes, you're gonna find a this one's sandwiched in, but you'll find lichens in there. And so this is where we keep them um, for research. Um, it's almost like a library, but um, we are really actively using everything that's in here. Um, and they're really valuable for the studies that we do. And so it's not just a room full of specimens that are just sitting there. I personally, for my research, am interested in DNA. So DNA, if you don't know, is like the recipe that every living thing has in their cells. And studying the DNA can help us figure out how things are related to each other and even help us look at the evolutionary history. Um, so when you're looking at the DNA, if it's more similar, then that indicates that it's more related usually. Um, and so we have been able to pull out this DNA from specimens in this room, even older specimens though DNA does tend to break down over time. Um, so I want to tell you about a few different projects that we've done just in the last couple of years with lichens here in this room, even with the specimens that I have right next to me. So the first one that I want to tell you about is a species of disc lichen. So there's a species of disc lichen that, um, and this is the one that we, I'll take it out and show it to you. So it's collected, we collected a bunch of disc lichens here in Utah and in the mountains of Nevada. And I'm sure if you saw this growing on a rock somewhere, you would not even think twice about it being part of the rock. But those little black specks on there are what is this disc lichen. So it really does look like it's part of the rock, but we were able to sequence um, specimens that we found here in Utah and in Nevada, and we compared it to the same species, or uh, there's, okay, I'll back up a little bit. So there's species of disc lichen that are growing in Antarctica, and we think, we've thought in the past that they're growing only there and nowhere else, and that means that they're endemic. So it's when they're just, just growing in this one area, and they're really unique to that area. But we sequenced the DNA of these disc lichens and compared them to the ones that are in Antarctica that we thought were just growing there. And we actually found that the, these specimens that we got in Utah are more closely related to the ones 
in Antarctica than they are to even other lichens growing here in Utah um, of the same um, group of lichens. So that's a really fascinating thing to, a question to ask with the DNA. And, um, and it brings up these other questions like, did we historically have more connectivity between Western North America and Antarctica? Was there like an easier way for um, living things to get around between those two places? Or maybe lichens are just better at getting around or dispersing than we previously thought? So just asking that one question of comparing these two um, species and of organisms growing in two different places and you get these um, more questions that are revealed to you. It's kind of how science works. You never really fully answer one question, but you kind of open up more questions as you go along. And then next, I want to tell you a little bit more about, let me put this away. So I want to tell you more about um, the specimens that we, that museums, so most museums have a collection like this um, in their, their facility. And every museum has what's called a holotype. So this is um, the one and only specimen that someone used when they were naming a new species. So say you go out and you find this um, lichen growing somewhere and you're like, hey, this looks a little bit different or very different than everything I've seen in the past. And you do more research and you find that you found a new lichen species. And so then it's up to you or whoever is the authority or the most, <laughs> um, they know the most about that um, species, um, you will use that specimen to name the, that entire new species. So you're going to be looking at how it looks, the different features. Um, recently we've been relying a lot more on the DNA and so you'll um, extract the DNA, you'll pull out the DNA and use that. Um, and so you will keep a hold of this holotype, this one um, reference specimen, and keep that in the collection. Um, so most species have a holotype somewhere in a museum collection. There's also something called an isotype, which is something that was collected at the same time and place as a holotype. So since there can be only one holotype, then everything else that was collected at that same place, the same time, while you were out there collecting lichens, um, is an isotype. And so we have been asking some questions about the isotypes of rock posy lichens here in this herbarium. Um, and so we did a little experiment seeing if we could get DNA from um, lichen specimens that are over 30 years old. And so, as I mentioned, DNA tends to break down over time, but we were able to find a way to get enough DNA uh, to give us a clear enough picture of um, these rock posy isotypes that we have here in this herbarium. Um, and so we got their DNA and compared them to similar species. And with that, we were able to find out that one of the subspecies is actually its own species. So it once fit into this one um, species and then there were two different subspecies. But by looking at this DNA, we were able to find out that it was actually its own species, which really changes the way that we study it. Um, and it was, what, it was exciting for us to figure that out, to see that um, it was different enough that it could be its own species. And then we also have, and this was part of the same study, but we also have, um, here it is. So we also had this specimen that was collected in 1989. Um, and we looked at it and we thought, that looks like it could be that species, but it looks a little bit weird. It doesn't look quite, um, quite like what it was, what they identified it as. And so here's what, oh, I don't know. How, let me see how I can hold this up to you. So that's what it looks like. And that was a little bit blurry. Maybe if I hold it back a little bit more, but, um, and so that's called its scientific name, which I don't expect you to hold on to, but it's called Rhizoplaca, and we thought it was Haydenii, um, and that's a rock posy lichen. And what we um, 
Let's see. I don't think I actually have one over here. But we thought that looks a little bit weird and we might want to look and dig in a little bit deeper and um, see if we can find some answers because that doesn't look quite right. So we got that specimen's DNA and as I mentioned it's from 1989 so that's a very old specimen and um, we sequenced the DNA and then we found out that it was a completely unrelated species. It was, it was actually a species of rock shield lichen. So that's completely different than what it was just, um, identified as in this. And so that was really important for us because here in the herbarium, we want to have the most accurate collection that we can, um, you know, because this is a resource to people and um, every component that we have here in the herbarium is a really important resource to us and to anyone else who studies lichen. Um, and here in the herbarium, we have ways of exchanging material with other herbariums. So say I or someone from, um, you know, another country has questions about comparing their species to the species that we have here in Utah, they might want to get um, a few samples of the lichens that we have here, either to, well, probably not to extract DNA because we usually don't like to destructively sample. Um, we don't want, like to destroy the samples to get more, but they might want to look at it closer. So then we would do an exchange and send it off to them and then they could do their research on it. Um, so it's a really important way of connecting with other herbariums so that they're able to do research a more um, wide range or even ask more specific questions and have the, the resources that they need to answer them. Um, and then lastly, well not lastly, I have a few more things that I want to share, but I also wanted to show you, so I mentioned um, when we are, so herbariums are really looking closely at the specimens and really analyzing them in any way that we can, either by looking at the way that it looks, the DNA, or even looking at the chemistry of it. Um, recently, we were able to describe a new species um, that's found here in Utah. And let me see if I can hold this up to you. So this was collected in 1992 here um, in Utah. And as you can see, you know, this is another um, really, if you might have, if you didn't know what you were looking for and you saw this, you might just think it's part of the rock, you know, it's gray and it's growing really closely against the rock, but it's actually a living, well, multiple living things that are just growing there. And so we were able to do some research on um, these uh, lichens that we found, and we were able to describe a new species. So describing a new species means that you're naming it, that like, this is gonna be its name, and everyone else has to use that name from now on. Um, and we named it Tintix cobblestone lichen, and it's named after the Ute subchief here in Utah. So names can be, um, can describe the organism, they can be about where it's from. Uh, I'm sure you've heard like famous people being named, or organisms being named after famous people, like I think something was named after Lady Gaga in the last five years. Um, and then last, I want to show you, so we have herbarium specimens here in the lichen herbarium. And then we also have a whole cabinet of what are called or elemental analysis um, specimens. And so these are separate from the herbarium. And we have over 1,800 specimens that were collected from over 450 permanent sites. And these are to use um, to measure air quality over time. So I mentioned earlier that lichens are a really good um, air quality biomonitor. And so one of the ways that we can um, assess the air quality is through environmental, elemental, I don't know why I keep saying environmental, elemental analysis. Um, and so because lichens are sensitive to pollution because they really easily absorb um, the toxins and the air around them, um, environmental analysis looks at the chemicals that are present in the lichen and they can tell you what chemicals were present in the air when they were collected. And so these are really valuable. We have some here, 
I'm not sure how old they go back, but I saw one when I was here a couple days ago that was from uh, about 70 years ago. Um, and since they don't change when we have the, them in these bags, we're able to go back in time and look at the lichens and do an elemental analysis and find out what the air quality was like when they were first collected. And then we can use that to compare um, uh, to a, something that was collected now in the same place and we can see how that has changed over time which is a really valuable way of assessing the air quality um, with just a little thing that's growing there um, so it's really cool that they can be used in these different ways to answer different questions that are really relevant to us and the way that we live our life so lichens are a small yet really important um, uh, uh, a thing to this world, like a really important creature, not a creature, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but a really important organism that contributes a lot to the way that we um, might experience the world. I'm sure now, well hopefully, now when you go for hikes, you'll start to notice them growing all over the place. Um, and so if you have any questions about lichens or the lichen herbarium, um, please feel free to leave a comment and I will answer any questions and I would try to answer any questions and um, it's been really great having you here with me in the Lichen Herbarium and I hope you learned a few exciting things today.